This is Talk About It Tuesday podcast, brought to you by yours truly, Ashley Morgan, the founder of Recycle to Riches, made in the middle of a pandemic where connection feels so far away. With this platform, we will be talking with world changers, wave makers, and environmental educators. We will collaborate, communicate, and educate as we do always. Make sure you listen, watch, and learn from these incredible minds that are changing the culture of consumption every single day. Without further ado, let us talk about it, people. This is Talk About It Tuesday, people. We are talking all things non-tox life in our May episode of 2023. We have an amazing guest, Anna Turns. She's an environmental journalist based in Denver, UK. She's the author of Go Toxic Free, an incredible book, if I do say so myself. Writing is one of her passions. She's also a lecturer and a radio presenter. So without further ado, let's talk about it, people. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be talking to you today. Um, So I'm Anna, I'm an environmental journalist based in the UK. Um, I specialize in writing and broadcasting about solutions. So I take lots of tricky subjects like climate change and chemical pollution and look at the progress and the innovations and the amazing change makers around the world who are doing very cool stuff and just trying really hard to amplify those stories to hopefully inspire some, some positive action in the world. Yeah, and we are so happy that you're in the world because we definitely need more journalists in there in the environmental field that know how to communicate. So I just want to get right into it. What is like your overall mission? Number one, when you're writing, but number two, just as an environmental journalist. So I originally am a biologist and I've worked in the media for more than 20 years. And I feel that my niche, I suppose, is I'm a bit of a mediator. I've tried to translate really complex science um, by talking to experts, working out what's going on, and then translating that into stories and into like compelling, engaging words or um, audio docs or whatever it might be so that people can really understand it and it's not about dumbing stuff down it's about meeting the audience where they are I suppose and and taking it out of that scientific world and I'm quite interested in how science crosses over with culture with behavior change with arts with all of those kind of other areas so I I guess my mission is to make those environmental stories really mainstream and to make behavior change really possible So that actually, if everyone is doing something, that collective action can drive momentum and and create really big, impactful global change. Because actually, yes, what we do matters individually, um, but actually it's when everyone's doing the same thing and working towards similar goals, actually that's when the magic kind of happens. Yeah, for sure. When we're all working like a little beehive together, that's when yes. the magic happens for sure. And we've seen that in so many different ways in different climate summits that happen around the world or just policies that have been supported by the people. So um, I I really do feel like your first book, uh, Go Toxic Free, that was honestly exactly what you said. You're you explain it so well. And just how did you start this whole process? And and what inspired you to do your first book? So a few years ago, I ran a plastic pollution campaign with my daughter as part of a national initiative in the UK called Kids Against Plastic. And it was all very much about child-led um campaigning, empowering young people to find their voice and to ask people like businesses, restaurants, all those kind of stakeholders to ditch the single use plastic. And we saw a massive shift in our local community and it was really brilliant. And everyone else in the world then started like the momentum on plastic pollution awareness kind of really picked up over those following years. Not obviously just because of us. There were lots of big things happening in the world at that time. 
But I was left thinking, what happens to those plastic bottles once they're in the sea, when they break up into little pieces? What, what happens to the chemicals that leach out of them? It's all the invisible stuff that really fascinated me. And a plastic bottle or a bit of plastic litter is a very tangible thing. We see it on the street, we see it on the beach, we can pick it up, we touch it. We use these things every day and we recognize them all. And the chemical pollution story just hadn't really been told. And partly because it's a really difficult one to tell. It's invisible, we don't like thinking about it. It maybe sounds a bit overwhelming and a bit scary. People don't like chemistry sometimes. And so actually it was a really tricky one, but I quite like challenges. <laughs> so I actually had a publisher in the UK approach me to write the book and they had seen my writing and they liked the solutions focus sort of approach and they they wanted to collaborate on this book so initially I said no because I was really busy we were in the middle of a pandemic I didn't think I had time to write a whole book um, but actually I'm really really happy that I did do it because it was such a fascinating journey and I didn't know all the answers when I started out I had to interview scientists around the world and set up zoom calls with people at funny times of the day and do loads of really in-depth research and then sort of synthesize that into what's in the book now. So lots of top tips, lots of personal stories, lots of insight from projects around the world. And I think it's just really opened my eyes to how to connect people with these things that are around us all the time, but we just don't necessarily join the dots. And it's about thinking beyond what we see, I suppose. and and not just in terms of what's physically in front of us, but in terms of the wider supply chain. So thinking about this mug that my tea is in, like where was it made? Who made it? Where's it gonna go when it breaks? Like thinking in terms of those links that kind of link everything around the world. And I think more than any specific advice, and there is there are lots of top tips in the book, but more than that, I think it's about having a particular mindset and being really curious and being brave enough to ask lots of questions and to hold power to account and to kind of quiz retailers and manufacturers and employers about what they're doing, why they're doing it. And that's the message that I really hope comes across in the book to, to readers and, and hopefully empowers people to just question the status quo a bit and question that norm, because actually that's how we kind of shift that that current status, I suppose. Yep, status quo for sure. You're speaking our language. Every little <laughs> yeah. thing, the right <laughs> questions, be curious. Oh my gosh, love that. And I really, okay, so I'm a very slow reader and I'm on chapter two, almost to chapter three. So I, and you've sent it a while ago, I know, but I, I'm working on it and wow. I'm loving every single word, honestly. <laughs> like I am loving everything you say in it and just the the awesome, even helping me prevent my website sounding greenwashy, you know, yes. using those silly buzzwords without defining them or explaining where it's coming from, saying organic without actually explaining where the organic cotton is coming from, or can it actually truly be organic if you have to use the chemicals that you have in your face wash every day, you know? Um, so it's been such a help, even for me as somebody that is, I would say, a, a conscious consumer, you know, reading it, it helps me ask more questions mm. um, and really get more into it. So you actually measured out all of the toxins, it says in the book, in your home, right? And you got so, them tested. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't measure everything. So. Okay. The two things I really measured, or three things actually. So one, I had an, an air purifier that looked at the indoor air pollution and it didn't kind of detail exactly what was in it, but I could see that when I burnt the toast, for example, or had the oven on too long, it spiked up red and, and dissipated after that. But the really interesting things were, I had my house dust tested and I sent it off to a lab and I had my own blood tested. So I can talk you through those two things. So I'll start with the blood. Um, I, I spoke to a professor who had 
designed a certain blood test called the body burden test for the United Nations. And they were doing this safe planet project around the world, testing the blood of 100,000 people. And they wanted to see what was happening to chemical pollution in people's bodies in different parts of the world. And so he designed this test, which was um, assessing the levels of 100 POPs, which are persistent organic pollutants. So these are the chemicals that basically don't disappear once they're in your body very quickly. They, they linger and they stay same as they would do in the environment, in the soil, in the water, in the air. Um, so it's things like some pesticides. And there were particular ones that some had been banned, some were new. And he kind of created this profile, did this test on lots of people. They weren't doing it anymore. But I basically said to him, how can I get this test? I would love to know what's in my body so that I can explain to people, like, basically as a case study, kind of explain like what is happening inside me and make it much more real again, like making it a tangible thing. So I looked for people in the UK who could do this test and there weren't any labs at all or any universities that could do it. I ended up getting, going down the road, going to my doctors, having my blood taken and then um, couriering it off to a lab in Norway um, who took about six weeks to test my blood. It took them quite a long time, obviously they were doing other things, but it wasn't a quick and easy thing. And when the email came back from the lab, it was eight sides of um, Word doc. It was a really long document with all of these really complicated chemicals and all of these levels, all these concentrations that I could not decipher. It was just beyond me. Um, and, it, and I couldn't tell which ones were worrying and which ones weren't. So I got this professor back on to the Zoom um, with me and he talked me through. And to be honest, he said most of the things in my blood he would expect to see like everyone has a different profile everyone has different combinations of things depending on their lifestyle where they live their habits all of those things but there were a few things that stuck out to him as a bit unusual um there was one pesticide called oxychlordane which had been banned in 1981 in the uk i was born in 1980 um and it was at really quite high levels still considering it hadn't been around for a very long time and he said that it, that's partly because it has a really long half-life and this half-life is the time it takes for the chemical concentration to halve in in amounts basically um, and the half-life of this chemical was between 30 35 years so incredibly incredibly slow and it was still relatively high in my blood not to the point where I should be like panicking and like I mean there's nothing you can do once it's in your blood anyway um, but he said it's not necessarily going to directly cause me health harm now but just to be really aware that that is reflecting my history and actually it was quite interesting so my mother was um born and grew up in a farming um, community was possibly exposed to this pesticide just through it being sprayed on fields and it could have been passed to me through the womb or through breastfeeding perhaps and i've had children i've got two two kids and there's pretty high chance that they have this pesticide in them too and this was a massive wake up call to me because it just really, it really highlighted that yes, we need to ban these chemicals. Absolutely. There's no question. And bans do work, but they don't work quickly. It's not an immediate thing. These things linger in our bodies, in our environment for generations. And it, it just really, it just really drove me to want to amplify this message even more and kind of really sort of tell people that this really matters, like the decisions that governments make, that companies make, that all of these things that are happening, they affect individuals. Um, and the other, there were quite a few other things that he picked up on. One of the other most interesting things was he found various PFAS chemicals in my blood. Um, and PFAS has got quite a lot of press in the US. It's kind of catching up a little bit in the UK, but these polyfluoroalkyl substances these forever chemicals are all over the place. They're in our clothing to waterproof things. They're in our nonstick pans, in building materials everywhere and firefighting foam. And actually he said it could, it could be from any of those sources. It, it's hard to pin down. But I said, actually, I did grow up quite near an airport um, and at, at airports, they do use really high levels of firefighting foam. So it's possible that they, there were PFAS in the water supply possibly from that. I mean, there's no way of telling that at all. But these PFAS chemicals are not regulated in the same way as the banned pesticides from decades ago. And what I really wanted to emphasize was the fact that we need to 
have foresight and think really carefully about what we're letting out into the world now, these emerging pollutants are going to be legacy contaminants in the future for generations. So it's just thinking it's not rocket science, any of this. We need to be really precautionary in how we regulate these things. Yeah. Um, it was just, yeah, it was a bit of a, oh, okay, moment of like really thinking these things are actually physically in me um, and they're not going to just suddenly disappear. They're going to possibly be there for the rest of my life. So, yeah. And, and the other thing I would say, just quickly to add, I know the book is called Go Toxic Free. I don't think any of us can be completely toxic free. I think we all have this toxic load in us that like I'm not going to be able to purify my blood or live in a world where I'm not exposed to anything harmful ever again. But what I would say is it's about minimizing that impact. So yes, I've got these things in my blood already. I'm I'm not panicking about it. I'm just trying to streamline everything so that it's not kind of at the tipping point of being a really high toxic load. Um, the other test I had, so I, I did some hoovering <laughs> and then I collected some dust from my hoover bag and I wrapped it in tin foil and I sent it to this um, scientist at a lab in Birmingham University in the UK. And he has tested dust from all sorts of places, including spaceships from NASA and yeah, various, various cool places. And he tested it mainly for flame retardants. And he found lots and lots of different flame retardants from this dust. And he, he was really interesting. He called the dust the soil of the indoor environment. And he said, we can tell so much from house dust, from anyone's house dust. And depending on what you're testing for, you'll find different, different things. Um, in terms of the flame retardants, one of the interesting things he explained to me was that so many textiles have got, and sofas, for example, furniture, have got flame retardants in them, these chemicals that are supposedly going to limit the amount that they will be flammable, but they're not always 100% functional, um, but also electronics. And he said so many people forget to dust the Wi-Fi router, the TV, the DVD player, all of those things. And actually dust settles on these electronic gadgets. And sometimes the flame retardants will seep out of those while the dust is resting. And then when someone opens the window, the wind will blow the dust around, it will move around. It might settle on the floor. Your children might put it in their mouths. A cat might lick, lick it or whatever. And it's kind of in that system. So a really good solution is to just wipe down all of your electronic items, not manically, like maybe once a week, um, possibly, just with a damp cloth um no need to use fancy dusting sprays or anything like that um but just to kind of take that and remove it and put it in the bin away from that system so it's not polluting the air and going to be ingested ultimately wow what a great little tip honestly just real quick like once a week wipe down your technology yes. and your dust will be less pollutant to you <laughs> wow exactly. okay yeah and you do say that in the book you mentioned you know pretty much impossible to have a non-tox life in, yes. in this world we're living in. You know, we're in a linear economy. We're in a pollutant world. It's already out there. There are forever chemicals. They're already out there. Um, and I love that you said, you know, let's focus on the chemicals we're putting out now because these mm -hmm. will be legacy chemicals. And that is so true. It's it's just so true. Um, if if we're you're having children and we're thinking about the next generation to come, these are things we have to focus on now. Yeah. And yeah, I totally agree with you, Anna. That's right on the money. Um, so you are an environmental journalist for many different companies, but and I've read a couple of your articles, and I just wanted to uh you are a very clear communicator, and I'm wondering how you try to communicate a sustainable lifestyle, you know, without insulting your readers or making them feel like it's their fault, because you never made me feel in the book. I never felt like this was my fault. I always felt like I had a way out, honestly, mm. while I was reading. So I'm just wondering how you do that and, or yeah. Um, so I, I try really hard never to be preachy and I'm often sharing other people's expertise as well. And so I'm kind of giving them a platform and, and kind of saying, look, come over here, listen to this person. They've got some really cool new research or science or something. Um, I think it's about 
I mean, I'm part of this system too. I am absolutely not perfect. I don't live in this immaculate house with like nothing bad because just historically we've got stuff here and secondhand things like you accumulate things and I'm not going to just chuck them out because do you know what I mean? It's kind of the reality is I am absolutely not perfect and I don't expect anyone else to be like, I think that's a complete misnomer. And I think we've all just got to do our best and find something that for us and for our lifestyle and for our family is joyful. And whether that is repairing clothes or sharing a car or creating an allotment, whatever that might be, it doesn't have to be chemical related or climate related, but something that connects you to nature and that does good in the world that isn't just about being in that bubble of consumption because this overconsumption is fueling the chemical pollution crisis it's fueling the climate crisis and we don't have to be in this world like yes we have to go and buy food and, and live in a house and I get that we're not going to kind of extract ourselves from this entire planet but there are ways that we can be citizens rather than consumers and and feel more like stewards of the planet like this planet is going to be fine it's us that are going to be <laughs> in trouble the planet will recover and and it will survive long after we've all gone so actually I don't know there's a sense of like not making it too egocentric and thinking I I, I try never to patronize people like I'm I'm talking I try to be as authentic as possible I suppose and I talk from my own curiosity I don't have all the answers but I want to find them and I guess if I take my audience along with me on that journey to finding stuff out and some of the articles I write are much more personal as well and and really quite kind of um sort of sharing vulnerabilities in terms of how do we how do we navigate all of this environmentalism stuff and and I and I'm not scared of doing that because I feel like that people identify with that and it connects people to the story um, but also again I think a lot of it is about highlighting the solutions because often people want to know what the solutions are but they might not know they exist or they might not realize that they could go to a different store or they could have a slightly different cleaning routine and it, it might just not have occurred to them so it's about showing what's possible rather than saying do like, this so, yeah and, and also my language so I try really hard not to say don't do this Right. It's much more about choose this, like it's a solution. Yeah, exactly. So rather than saying what you're doing already is bad, because often people have everything's a compromise, isn't it? People have got different priorities, different amounts of money, different situations, different access to things. It's never it, it's not us that's wrong, but I think we are catalysts within the system, and I think once we know what the solutions are and we can we can move towards them, we can then challenge that system and use our voices in a really powerful way. So I think that's what I'm trying to do, but hopefully in a positive, not preachy way. <laughs> you definitely accomplished that goal okay, for good. sure. <laughs> I, you. I feel very encouraged when I'm reading the book and just any of your articles. It's just more, um, it's communication in a clear way, but it also makes you feel relatable. Like I can relate yeah. to your lifestyle too. And I don't have to be like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, it's me. Cause a lot of these articles or documentaries, they make you feel like it is you. That's the problem, but it's not, yeah. it's not. <laughs> Um, so we're running kind of short on time because we just have so much information within every question and I'm loving it. So I'm going to skip right down to one of my favorite questions that I love. So what is your favorite environmental quote? I'm going to have to pause really quickly because I wrote them down and I can't remember where I've saved them. So I've got, I've got a couple, but just bear with me. I'm so sorry. Hang on. Don't oh, take your time. My desktop. Um, oh, where have I put them? I literally, I did it this morning. Like, I, I know them. <laughs> no, I, thing is, they're just, they're just a little bit longer than that. Yeah. And I've got more than one, but. Um, I 
sorry, I know you're right. Oh, no. here we go. It's under favorite eco quotes. There you go. Um, so I've got a couple. I don't know if I'm allowed more than one quote. Yes. <laughs> so really quick. So I often hashtag be the change in a lot of my posts. So be the change you want to see in the world by Mahatma Gandhi. It's living it, like walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Um, another quote I've got on my website is by Margaret Mead, who's an American anthropologist. And she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I just feel like that summarizes what you're doing. It summarizes what so many amazing people are doing around the world. And that collective action, that, um, that voice as a, as a community can really challenge things and yeah, just help, help solve a lot of problems. Um, but there's another one that if I have got time that is more connected to Go Toxic Free. So Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring many decades ago, and I kind of wish I didn't have to write my book. I kind of wish everyone had listened to her wake up call about pesticides and all of these chemicals that were being used in industrial agriculture. And it's scary that it's this long after her book came out in uh, 50, 60 years ago, that actually a lot of my messages are very similar. <laughs> Uh, slightly different and things have changed more chemicals have come out since her book but one of the things she said that still absolutely resonates today is a who's who of pesticides is therefore a concern to all of us if we are going to live so intimately with these chemicals eating and drinking them taking them into the very marrow of our bones we had better know something about their nature and their power yeah, that that was exactly that was one of the books that got me on my journey as well. This Silent Springs. And I, I tell everyone it's an oldie, but a goodie like yeah. you. Sadly, we didn't listen, you know, but it is such the truth of what we were doing at that time. Um, yeah, she was before her time. For she sure. Was. Yeah, which which it was the right time to start, but no one listened. Um but that's okay. <laughs> we're doing it now. Hopefully we're doing the best we can now. Um, okay. So what's next for Anna Turns? What are you writing more books, more articles? What's next? There might possibly be another book in the pipeline. Um, similar subject, but possibly for children. So making it even simpler and even more positive. Um, I'm going to be doing some more audio work and lots more articles just yeah i'm just going to keep going <laughs> yeah pushing through um yeah. foraging on so so okay i always like to ask our guests what the recycle to riches community can do to support you and how we can uplift your mission and what you're doing thank you so i think we have very we have values that are very very aligned i would say um so just share this podcast and talk about the issues read the book if you like i think a lot of it is about conversations and and also i know you said you're kind of starting to read the book it doesn't have to be something you sit down and read the whole of it's actually quite a good book to dip in and out of so if you've got somebody who's going on holiday and wants to know about the best sunscreen to wear or if you want to have a clear out in the cupboard under your kitchen sink and you want to sort out the cleaning products or the bathroom cabinet it's a really good book to kind of dip in and out, read a few pages, look at the top tips, apply that next time you go shopping or talk to a friend about it and share it. And it's, it's kind of helping to empower people in their homes, but also communities, schools, businesses, all of those things. Um, and I know people in the UK who have passed the book on to people and like one of the, one of the people who's received it has runs a village shop and they've completely changed what they've sold because of reading this book and you just think you just never know where that's going to go and where that's going to take you so I, I just feel like having more of those conversations just be curious ask lots of questions look for the answer in the book if it's not in the book just ask ask who you need to ask and yeah continue to, to imagine a better future mm -hmm. Yeah, you heard it here first. Be curious <laughs> um, and definitely buy her book. It is phenomenal. You should just go look at it and just, just download it, guys. It's so worth it. It was something that 
am going to have in my environmental library forever now. It's Aww. a, it's a legacy book. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us on Talk About It Tuesday and giving us all those incredible little nuggets to chew on and stay curious people and stay connected. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed watching, listening, and learning from Anna Turns. This was our May episode 2023 on all things non-tox and closed loop. I think one takeaway we can understand from this episode is there is not a non-toxic life out there right now. And closed loop is not close enough. Thank you, Anna Turns, for everything that you've given to this episode and Talk About It Tuesday and this world. Keep changing the culture of consumption, and we'll reach back out to you, community, on June for our R2R episode, Next Steps. Can't wait to watch, listen, and learn with you for next month's episode. Until then, let's never stop talking about it, community.